Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. During a video conference with leaders of all political parties, the Prime Minister has said that the country is going through a social emergency and hence it is not possible to lift the lockdown in one go as per the suggestions received from various experts. So the Prime Minister has indicated that the current lockdown won't be coming to an end on the 14th of April and it is most likely to be extended. But the extended lockdown might not be in its current form and we might be looking at a staggered exit or a calibrated exit from the lockdown. The Prime Minister has also said that before making any such decisions, he shall be interacting with all the chief ministers and this indicates that the central government is looking at a more decentralized approach to control the pandemic which will provide for more flexibility to the state governments. So in preparation for this staggered exit, the Union Health Ministry has said that it will work with the state governments to further increase testing, contact tracing and to strengthen the healthcare infrastructure in order to prepare for a surge in cases in the coming weeks. In this context, the Bilwara model of containment has been gaining a lot of popularity and it has been so effective that even the cabinet secretary has asked the other state governments to follow the Bilwara model. See, we have discussed in an earlier session that Bilwara is the textile capital of Rajasthan. By the third week of March, Bilwara had emerged as a hotspot for COVID-19 cases after multiple clusters started emerging in the district. But within two weeks, Bilwara has managed to flatten the curve and over the last five to six days, not a single positive case has been reported from Bilwara. This success has been attributed to the effective implementation of a unique containment strategy by the district administration with the support of the state government and the central government. This containment strategy is being popularly referred to as the Bilwara model. Under this model, the district administration relied upon an aggressive strategy to contain the spread of clusters. The primary focus of this model was to isolate the clusters that were forming in the district. The district authorities focused on isolating each cluster and each hotspot with a strict implementation of a lockdown under the Epidemic Diseases Act accompanied with a curfew under Section 144 of the CRPC. As Bilwara started to emerge as a major hotspot in the country, the district authorities completely sealed off the district borders and the entire district was cut off from the rest of the state. The district administration worked with the local police and other government departments to impose a total ban on all movement including the movement of essential items. The idea was to restrict people to their homes and ensure that they do not step outside even for buying essential items. So the district administration took care to deliver essential items such as vegetables, milk, medicine, etc. directly to their homes. Every morning, the local constables would visit each household and take down the list of essential items that they needed and ensure that it would be delivered by afternoon or evening. Dedicated helplines and control rooms were set up where people could call and give out a list of essential items along with their address and the district administration ensured that these essential items were directly delivered to their doorstep. Then within the district, whenever a new case or a new cluster started forming, the district authorities would immediately move in to establish a containment zone and a buffer zone in a 2 km radius. This area or locality would be completely cut off from the rest of the district and a total ban on movement would be implemented. With the help of the police, the district administration ensured that not a single person within the containment and buffer zone stepped out of their house and all the required essential items were being directly delivered to their doorsteps. As soon as the containment zone was established around the cluster, the health authorities would move in to set up aggressive contact tracing, screening and testing in order to identify high-risk contacts and suspected cases and they would be moved to quarantine facilities for further treatment. Then apart from this, the district administration would work with other government departments to carry out daily disinfection of high-risk areas such as the containment and buffer zones, 
the localities where positive cases were detected, all ambulances and police vehicles, the screening and quarantine facilities, the offices of the district collectorate, government departments, police stations, etc. Then in order to establish adequate quarantine facilities, the district administration had taken over a few private hospitals and as well as hotels in the district. So it is through this aggressive containment strategy, the district authorities of Bilwara have successfully managed to flatten the curve, at least for the time being. This successful containment model has been referred to as a role model by the cabinet secretary and it is already being implemented in around 15 hotspots in Uttar Pradesh and as well as in around 20 localities in the national capital. Most likely, this containment model will be extended to other hotspots across the country as a part of the staggered exit from the lockdown. Then in another article on page number 5, it has been reported that an expert committee set up by the Kerala government has recommended a three-phased withdrawal from the lockdown. So kindly go through these recommendations. This also indicates that the central government is looking to adopt a more consultative and decentralized approach which will provide more flexibility to the state governments to decide upon the manner in which they want to exit from the lockdown. Now let's take up a column from page number 7 written by Nandini Vijay Raghavan. In this column, the writer is suggesting two ways through which the government can raise finances for a pandemic rescue package in order to kickstart the economy. See, it is a given fact that the Indian economy has more or less come to a standstill due to the COVID-19 lockdown. So to support the economy, the government of India and the RBI have come out with a couple of packages. But it is very clear that these packages would be sufficient to revive growth. So if the economy has to be kick-started from this unprecedented crisis, then the government has to come out with a massive rescue package. But the question is, how will the government finance such a rescue package? The writer suggests that such an economic package can be financed through two options. One, by issuing GDP-linked bonds. And second, by streamlining the public sector units and by tapping into their non-core assets. The writer says that the government can raise finances by issuing a GDP-linked bond with a 25-year maturity that can be called by the investor from the fifth year onwards. The writer says that such a GDP-linked bond would be beneficial to both the government and as well as the investor. Since the obligation of the government to the investor is tied to the GDP growth of the country, it reduces the repayment burden on the government. It means that during years of low growth, there is a low repayment obligation on the government and during years of high growth, it provides high returns to the investor. The writer says that such a financing option provides a risk-free option to the government, but the only requirement is that the government has to come out with reliable GDP data every year. For this, the Indian government can draw lessons from other countries such as Costa Rica, Bulgaria, Bosnia-Herzegovina, which had issued similar GDP-linked bonds when their economies were going through a financial crisis in the 1990s. The same approach was followed by Argentina and Greece as well when they went through an economic crisis in 2005 and 2012 respectively. The experiences of these countries provides valuable lessons for India for raising risk-free finance by issuing GDP-linked bonds. Next, the writer says that the Indian government could finance the rescue package by tapping into the non-core assets of public sector units. See, top performing PSUs such as ONGC, Coal India Limited, etc. They have accumulated substantial amount of non-core assets which can be monetized by the government in order to raise finances for the rescue package. These PSUs have made a number of financial investments that are not a part of their core business. They have given out large loans to their employees. They maintain large bank deposits and a huge cash reserve in excess of their operational requirement. And they also own huge plots of high-value real estate, most of which is lying idle. Such non-core assets can be monetized and the proceeds can be held by a holding company through which 
the rescue package can be financed. For implementing this, India could learn from the holding company model that has been implemented in Singapore and Malaysia. But the writer is cautioning the Indian government to not rely upon RBI's dividends for financing the rescue package. Because see, a part of RBI's dividends is transferred to the government every year. But in 2019, the government asked the RBI to transfer 100% of its dividend and this goes against the recommendations of the Bimal Jalan committee. This committee was set up by the RBI in 2019 to review its economic capital framework. And the Bimal Jalan committee had recommended that the periodic transfer of dividends from the RBI to the government should be done only under exceptional circumstances. The current crisis definitely qualifies as an exceptional circumstance, but according to the Bimal Jalan committee, these dividends, at least a large part of it, should be retained with the RBI because it can act as a buffer which can be used by the RBI to ensure the stability of the financial sector. So since RBI's dividends are crucial to ensuring the stability of the financial sector, the writer is asking the government to not rely upon RBI's dividends to finance the rescue package. Instead, she is recommending the government to issue GDP-linked bonds and tap into the non-core assets of PSUs. Now let's take up another column from page number 7. In this column, written by T.P. Srinivasan, the writer is arguing that the World Health Organization has failed to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic because the primary responsibility of the WHO was to monitor such threats and issue suitable advisories and inform the member states. According to the writer, the WHO has clearly failed at this responsibility. In this context, the writer refers to the lack of international cooperation amongst countries to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. He says that the sole international organization which had those kind of powers, that is the United Nations, has also failed at this responsibility. He especially blames the UN Security Council, which has been paralyzed due to the blame game which is going on amongst the P5 countries. The United States and China have been busy blaming each other instead of working together and making use of the UN platform to provide for a coordinated approach against the pandemic. It is quite shocking that the UN Security Council has failed to meet even once to discuss the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is mainly because China was holding the chair of the UNSC. Since China was wary of being blamed for the pandemic by the United States, it used its position as the chair of the UNSC to block any debate on the pandemic. So considering the failure of these international organizations, the writer gives a call for the establishment of a new special UN force that could help the member countries of the UN in their fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The writer says that the UN Secretary General can provide for the establishment of such a special force by making use of the provisions under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. See, the primary objective of the United Nations and the UN Charter is to protect and promote international peace and security. So the writer says that the COVID-19 pandemic is possibly the greatest threat to international peace and security. Because if the pandemic and the economic crisis are not contained, then it could easily result in internal unrest in a number of countries and it could also result in the breakout of conflicts between different countries and hence it represents the greatest threat to international peace and security. So to prevent this from happening, the writer recommends the establishment of a new special UN force on the lines of the UN peacekeeping forces and all the member countries of the UN could be mandated to contribute the required troops, police forces, health workers and medical equipment to this proposed special UN force. Then the new special force of the United Nations could be financed and deployed similar to the UN peacekeeping forces which are largely financed and deployed by the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. The writer also says that the new special UN force could be referred to as the Red Berets, similar to the UN peacekeeping forces which are referred to as the Blue Berets. Now let's take up the next article. If you study the COVID-19 statistics from various countries, it will help you understand 
the skewed gender balance that is present in different societies. For example, if you look at the data from developed countries and advanced economies, you will find that nearly 50% of those who have been infected are women. You can see in this graph that countries such as South Korea, Australia, China, Italy, Japan, etc. Nearly 50% of those who have been infected are women and it also reflects gender equality in their societies. But in developing countries such as India and Pakistan, a majority of those who have been infected are men. In the case of India, men account for 76% of the infections and in the case of Pakistan, men account for 72% of the infections. So this is a reflection of employment trends in a developing country and it shows how in a patriarchal society, far more men are employed than women. This also reflects the limited mobility options that are available to women in a patriarchal society. Because the less you travel and the more you're unemployed, the chances of catching the infection are lower. But these statistics reflect the skewed gender balance in countries such as India and Pakistan. Now let's take up the next article. The Indian Air Force has carried out a top secret operation in order to evacuate Indian diplomats and Indian officials who had been deployed in Indian consulates in Herat and Jalalabad. For this mission, the Indian Air Force has used the C-130J Super Hercules transport aircraft and along with evacuating Indian officials, it has also evacuated ITBP personnel who have been deployed in Afghanistan to guard and protect the Indian Embassy and the consulates. The Indian government has said that the evacuation has been carried out due to the COVID-19 pandemic threat and due to the deteriorating security situation in Afghanistan. But a careful analysis shows that the evacuation has been carried out more because of the deteriorating security situation and not because of the pandemic. Because see, more than Afghanistan, the pandemic has affected countries such as China, Italy and the United States. But despite this, Indian diplomats continue to work and function out of the embassies and consulates that are located in these countries. But the evacuation from Herat and Jalalabad shows that India feels an increased security risk to its interests in Afghanistan after the US-Taliban deal was signed. We have discussed in the past that the US-Taliban peace deal has more or less allowed the Taliban to return to power in Afghanistan and this has emboldened Pakistan to use its proxies such as the Haqqani network and the ISIS-K to target Indian interests in Afghanistan. See, the return of Taliban strengthens the position of Pakistan in Afghanistan because the Taliban is seen as a puppet of Pakistan's ISI. Factions of Taliban such as the Haqqani network has been used by the ISI in the past to carry out multiple attacks against the Indian embassy and consulates in Afghanistan. Recently, we have seen that a Gurudwara in Kabul was attacked and the attack was claimed by ISIS Khorasan and it has been speculated by Indian agencies that the Islamic State of Khorasan province is working at the behest of ISI. So these developments represents a major security risk for Indian interests in Afghanistan, especially its embassy and consulates. See, apart from maintaining an embassy in Afghanistan's capital Kabul, India also maintains a vast presence of consulates across Afghanistan. India has established four consulates after the Taliban was removed from power in 2001 by the United States after the 9-11 attacks. These consulates are located in Herat, Jalalabad, Kandahar and mazar sharif So considering the increased security risk, India has executed a top secret operation to evacuate its diplomats and personnel from the consulates in Herat and Jalalabad and similar contingency plans have been kept ready to evacuate the embassy in Kabul and the consulates in Kandahar and mazar sharif if the situation arises. Now let's take up the next article. We have discussed over the last one week as to how the lockdown has resulted in a significant increase in the cases of domestic violence against women. This concern has been flagged by UN Women and as well as by India's National Commission of Women. A similar concern has arisen with regard to increasing cases of child abuse as well. The dedicated helpline for registering cases against child abuse 
has seen a significant increase in the number of complaints during the lockdown period. So in order to protect and support the victims of domestic violence, the Ministry of Women and Child Development has come out with a series of measures. In a video conference involving the Union Minister for Women and Child Development, Smriti Irani, and personnel from various institutes linked to women and child development, it has been decided that the one-stop centers for addressing domestic violence should extend all possible legal, psychological and social support to the victims of domestic violence. These one-stop centers have been set up to link the victims of domestic violence with the police, with the local medical teams and the National Legal Services Authority and its state level and district level organizations. The Union Minister has directed the one-stop centers to make use of digital tools in order to overcome the restrictions of lockdown, in order to connect the victims of domestic violence with institutions such as Nimans for providing psychological support and counselling, for connecting the victims with NGOs for providing social support, and for connecting the victims with institutions such as NALSA and its state level and district level branches for providing legal support in order to secure justice to the victims of domestic violence. Plus, the minister has also directed shelter homes such as Swadhar Griha and Ujwala homes to accept women who are in distress during the lockdown period. Now, let us take up the practice questions. Which of the following statements are correct? The Indian Council for Cultural Relations was founded in 1950 by Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. Its objectives are to promote India's external cultural relations and carry forward cultural diplomacy. Both the statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following can be considered as elements of India's soft power? To answer this question, first we need to understand what is soft power. See, in diplomacy, a country can project its influence through the projection of hard power and its soft power. Hard power refers to the military might and economic might of a country, whereas soft power refers to the cultural and civilizational heritage of the country. So clearly, yoga is a part of India's cultural and civilizational heritage and Indian diplomacy has been projecting it as a cultural symbol of India and this is evident from the designation of International Yoga Day by the United Nations. Then Bollywood or any other movie industry which has a widespread following in other countries is also a part of India's cultural symbol. And of course, traditional Indian dances and music is also a part of it. The Indian diaspora, its influence and its heritage is also a part of India's soft power because members of the Indian diaspora act as India's cultural ambassadors in other countries. Then Buddhism, which took birth in the Indian subcontinent, also happens to be a part of India's cultural heritage. And since it is a major religion in most of the Southeast Asian and East Asian countries, projecting India's Buddhist heritage has been made an integral part of India's Act East policy. Then even India's colonial legacy and anti-imperialism stand is a part of its soft power because India's freedom struggle inspired the freedom struggle of many other countries across Asia, Africa and the Indian Ocean region. So all these cultural elements are being tapped by Indian diplomacy in order to extend India's influence across the world. So the correct answer would be option D. These two questions were asked because according to this article on page number 8, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations marks its 70th anniversary on the 9th of April. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? The army worm is an invasive pest that can damage and destroy a wide variety of crops. It is found only in South Asia. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect because the army worm can be found across North America, Africa and Asia. And this invasive pest can affect around 80 types of crops. So the correct answer is option A, one only. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 11, the infestation of army worm in Assam is affecting the harvest of paddy crop. Now let's take up the next practice question. Consider the following statements about the National Board for Wildlife. It is a statutory organization constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. It has the power 
to review all wildlife related matters and approve projects in and around national parks and sanctuaries no alteration of boundaries in national parks and wildlife sanctuaries can be done without the approval of the national board for wildlife it is headed by the minister for environment forest and climate change amongst the given statements the fourth statement is incorrect because the national board for wildlife is headed by the prime minister so the correct answer is option b 1 2 and 3 only this question has been asked because according to this article on page number 8 the standing committee of the national board for wildlife which is headed by the union environment minister has approved a number of infrastructure projects now let us take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper in which of the following regions of india are shale gas reserves found is it kambay basin or kaveri basin or the krishna godavari basin the correct answer is option d shale gas reserves are found in all the three given basins please look at this map shale gas reserves are found in india in the kambay basin the krishna godavari basin the kaveri basin in the indus basin in the indo gangetic basin in the gondwana basin and as well as in the assam arakan basin finally let's take up a couple of mains practice questions the first question the government of india plans to contain large outbreaks of covid-19 by employing the bilwara model discuss the second question suggest how psus and its assets can be tapped by the government to revive the economy that has been brought to a standstill by the covid-19 pandemic kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below so this concludes our discussion for the day thanks for watching